pleasure to be here. Thanks, Planet Science. You made a big error in inviting me to come here, but I'll make the most of it. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Particularly, I do want to say a big thanks to my mum, who came all the way from Cornwall with my with my best name today. Um, on the train. On the train. <laughs> <laughs> Poor woman. So yeah. Um, as Avita said, I'm going to be talking about snake bite, which is the subject of my PhD. And hopefully you're all going to leave here being pretty fascinated about, um, about snake bites. No way to go. So, hmm? man, I was a good looking kid, real good looking kid, um, heartbreaker. And this was when I got my first snake, I was like 10 years old. Sadly, I, I did accidentally flush this snake down the toilet. Um, but we got a new snake and uh, he's here today, thanks to my mother. Um, but snakes, um, it's sort of like a, a gateway drug for me. It was like it was like somebody smoking some cannabis because quickly it just wasn't enough, and I was on like the cocaine and crack cocaine of, of snakes. And it's like um, it's sort of like an adrenaline junkie sort of thing. Um, you, you catch big snakes, and it, it gives you such a thrill. And much in the same way that a base jumper probably doesn't study like if you fall from the sky and, and the, the parachute doesn't come out, the, the effects that landing on the ground very hard have on you. I had no idea what would happen if actually this went very wrong and, and one of them bit me properly um, until starting this PhD. Um, that said, <laughs> I did have some bites along the way. And um, this, this was like, uh, I was with this American guy and, um, and there's this really big snake. And, um, and just before I got it, he said, don't worry about this one, guy. Yeah, these guys never bite. So I was like, okay, great. Caught it, and it bit me really, really badly, immediately. And there was like a huge amount of blood, but it was actually a pretty, pretty friendly snake, so I was in luck. But um, as Nicholas Cage, one of the world's finest actors says, all good stories start with a snake. But what, what he really doesn't cover is the fact that actually a huge number of sad stories start with a snake. And um, I spent the first three three months of this year working in India, and I saw firsthand that actually, um, not only is is it like physical disability a commonplace in snake bite, like people frequently suffer amputations. It's actually financially crippling, and not just to the individual. It's like their whole families and sometimes whole villages have to all club together to pay for this treatment, which is like extortionate for these people who are working in the fields, um, and they're not wearing any shoes and everything. And mostly down to this terrible, terrible treatment we have at the moment, which is sort of like, it's a broad spectrum. It's like if somebody's bitten by a snake in a particular area, there'll just be one treatment. It might work, it might not. It almost certainly will have adverse effects, like people will be allergic to it. And it's actually really brutal. And sometimes people can spend like months in hospital, and the amount of money they have to pay for that is just not on their pay rate. Um, and we are all blessed, well, all of the Brits among us are blessed with living in Britain. We only have the adder to contend with. And according to the Daily Mail, the last bite <laughs> death from an adder bite was in 1975. And so I think most of us are probably wondering right now, like, is, is this really like something we need to be concerned about? But if we go to the tropics and, and we look at where these um, cold blood animals really thrive, um, then what you see is like in sub-Saharan Africa, um, you get 15,000 amputations every year. Um, in, in, in India, it's like 50,000 deaths a year. And worldwide, we're talking about 150,000 deaths a year. And this is like the minimum. It's probably much more than this because people who are bitten by snakes, are, are all too frequently they go to traditional healers because they can't afford hospitals. Um, so this is probably an underestimation. And the real difficulty with treating snake bites is um, currently it's classed as one neglected tropical disease, it's one disease. But actually, there are 700 odd species of venomous snakes, and each one of them have a load of different toxins in their venom. And essentially, each one is giving you a different disease. But we've just we've just lumped them all together. Um, and you can sort of like crudely elucidate some of the effects that, that come from these. And 99% of, of bites from venomous snakes come from from these two families: Viperidae and Elapidae. So Viperidae, these are the vipers. We've got like the European adder here. That's a viper. Uh, Kaboon vipers, puff adders, rattlesnakes in America, these are all vipers. And when they bite you, it's predominantly the cardiovascular system and your, your blood that is really affected. And I'm going to talk about that. And um, in Elapidae, these are cobras, crates, and mammoths. These are all the, like, the scary Australian snakes that, that are really like, scary, but there's actually only two deaths in Australia every year from snake bites. Um, 
these are all in a lap a day. And these have neurotoxic elements. So it means it doesn't really affect the blood too much. It just targets the nerves. And so people who are bitten by these things, they, they swiftly descend into like sort of flaccid paralysis and die because they just can't breathe. Um, but I'm going to talk about these in much more depth, don't worry, there'll be some really juicy pictures. So I see you're all worried that I'm not talking about this enough. <laughs> don't worry, there'll be lots of blood. Um, but to make matters much more complicated, um, there are also quite a lot of other snakes. Um, so at the top there, we, we have Colubrinate. This is like a family that actually Sleepy, this guy belongs to, oh God, he's escaping. Um, <laughs> Sleepy belongs to. It's a family that have like snakes like Sleepy, who's just like friendly. He doesn't have fangs, he can't inject any venom. Um, but then they also have some really venomous species like boom slags, twig snakes, and vine snakes, which do kill people um, occasionally, but 99% they're sea scars. Um, they also, these colubrinates, like when they are venomous, they have they have fangs that are like right back in the mouth. They're, they're evolved to eat reptiles and amphibians, and so when they try and bite a human, it generally ends up that their fangs don't get in, so it's not really too much to worry about. Okay, next one, Attractaspidae. I love these guys, really cool. They just like burrow down into holes, and like if there's a whole family of mice there, they just stick out these big long fangs, just slash away, injecting venom, kill the whole family, and they just lay down there, hunker down for a while, gobble like eight little baby mice. And to be honest, like if I was a snake, that's, it's a lazy option, but it works. And then um, Hydrophinae, which is arguably their part of this, but these are sea snakes. And then these are like famed for their highly neurotoxic venoms. And if people are bitten by these snakes, then they can die very quickly. But these are snakes that live like in incredibly deep water. They love fish, they, they really don't like to hurt people. So if you get bitten by one of these snakes, you're an absolute idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so now I'm going to talk about this thing called the, the red green hypothesis quite quickly, which is basically explaining this, this arms race that takes place and the reason that venoms have evolved. Um, so obviously like you hear facts like, so the most venomous snake on, on this planet is called the Inland Taipan. And um, oh, spoiler, spoiler. Um, <laughs> and in its venom gland, it has, it has enough venom to kill about a million laboratory mice, which is, which is sort of something that I think most people can't really comprehend. And it, it doesn't seem right somehow, like what's gone wrong? But that is because these, these mice have been taken out of context, and that is the context of evolution. So um, the, the red green hypothesis um, is it's on this through the looking glass. There's a scene in through the looking glass. Fine ladies going inside my shirt. I was hoping this would happen all night. But um, <laughs> there's a scene where the red queen and Alice, you know, they're like running as fast as they can in this race, and neither of them are moving anywhere. Um, and this is exactly what takes place in evolution when you have a predator and a prey. So the predator is trying to develop more and more potent toxins, and the prey is trying to overcome these. And what that means is you get these crazy venoms that actually um, can do crazy amounts of damage when they're taken out of the species that's been evolving against. So that's why when these venoms <coughs> enter humans, um, it's horrible. And if you put them in lab mice, it's even worse. Um, but venoms are not something that are just found in snakes at all. And they've evolved in loads of different um, groups of animals. And the, the fun ones are always the platypus, um, duckbill platypus. They have in their, in their hind claw, they have a, a venom which they use to defend their, their territory. Um, and it's just the males that have it. Um, we have the lorises, which are the only venomous primate. They have some venoms in their, in their mouth, but they also have armpits that like secrete these toxins. So you'll see them like licking their armpits and then that's all just to make a juicy mix of toxins in their mouth. And then we have the insects, the wasp bees, and also arachnids, spider scorpions, all the Portuguese man of war and jellyfish. Even these cute little shrews, they have like these fantastic groove teeth, which, which mean that they can inject venom into, um, into, the, into the actually other mammals. Um, and vampire bats, which when, they, when they're feeding on somebody, they want to be able to keep licking up that blood. And if any clots are there, that's a bit of an issue. So they have venom to actually stop the blood clotting. But, I mean, I'm, I'm really only interested in snake bites, so let's move away from that. Um, independent of whether it's in snake venoms or all the other venoms, they're pretty much, venoms are made up of the same sort of stuff. It's all proteins and peptides. And um, here we have things like um, snake venom, seroproteases, three-finger toxins, dendrotoxins, C-type leptins, cystine with secretive proteins, and um, alumina acid oxidases. But that's um, beyond some of my friends here. I've got some really stupid mates here. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, um, so they can all basically be bundled into enzymes, which um, hopefully you'll know, but if you don't, you'll, you'll maybe remember them from like GCSE biology. Um, these are things that break down other compounds without being changed themselves. And in, in venoms, they break down proteins or they break down lipids, um, specifically phospholipids, which are the little fatty things that surround cells. And, um, and yeah. <laughs> uh, so enzymes and, and binding toxins, which are, um, which are much smaller proteins, and they, they just bind to receptors and enzymes, and they either stop the thing being able to do what it's supposed to do, or they make the thing do what it's supposed to do at the wrong time. Um, and enzymes are like what make up the majority of bifurvenoms, and these binding toxins really make up the majority of lapivenoms. So this is like the start point of where life gets interesting for me. And this is this is um, this seems quite like a simple concept, a snake bite, but actually it's it's really confusing because um, not only do you have all these really venomous species, that's, that's quite simple actually, so if you get bitten by a venomous snake, you have venom inside you and you're in a lot of trouble. Easy. But then you've got a lot of things in between that and snakes like Sleevy, where if Sleevy bit me, I'd be like, Sleevy, you naughty boy, but it's not a big deal. And then you get these mildly venomous snakes that have, they still have venoms, but they're more aimed at amphibians and reptiles. They might be swelling, make you think like you've been bitten by a dangerous snake, but in reality, it's fine. And then um, you also get highly venomous snakes that bite you, but for whatever reason decide not to inject any venom. Um, and this is this is might be because they've had a big meal like previously, where they've had to use a lot of their venom to kill the prey, um, or sometimes they're just I don't I don't really get it. Sometimes they're just like, hey, I don't fancy venoming this guy. <laughs> so most of my PhD work has actually been working on a pregnancy test, but for snake bites. So this has come off as two question marks, but. Um, it was supposed to be like the emoji where it's like. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, can you move into that side because we can't see? But then they can't see. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's a horrible situation. I'll sit down. Yeah. Like Everyone <laughs> happy? Last year, I was sat up there and we couldn't see anything for the whole talk, so stop moaning. <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> if you better understand this moment, then it means you can go and you can get a more specific treatment, which currently don't exist because they're banking on the fact that nobody knows what snake you've been bitten by, so they've just got to use this horrible broad spectrum thing. Um, but certainly for various reasons, I can't really talk to you very much about this, and I'm just going to go into some of the other research. So back to the bite side, bite, this bite point, okay? Um, so obviously the first thing that has to happen is the snake has to bite you, and I made this myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just do it a couple more times. This is, um, this is the point at which the snake bites in, and the, the, the fangs are going to go through the skin, hopefully. If they don't go through the skin, then you, you don't really need to worry very much, hopefully. Um, but normally they go through the skin, and then they enter this beautiful, liquidy area called the interstitial fluid. Um, and when the venom's in there, it's actually not too much of an issue. You're like, um, you can chill. You, that's why people don't really die in less than 20 minutes from snake bite. Because it's in this interstitial fluid, slowly being like moved into the bloodstream. That takes a little bit of time. Um, that said, what you do get at this point in time is, um, is yeah, um, I'm going to go down the route of bifurs to begin with, and then I'll talk to you about lactin venomation. But what you get in bifurs when you, the, the venom gets in the interstitial fluid is you get a huge number of local effects. And so I've got a few slides that are pretty horrible in this, but I've got my, my mate Susan Boyle is going to give you a thumbs up. And any of you who are squeamish, please cover your faces. Um, and on a side note, if you have heard her cover of Like a Prayer, <laughs> I seriously recommend it. <laughs> um, so the local effects. This is this is like what happens typically in bite and venomation, and also the, the cobras that are able to spit. They also do all this stuff. Um, so what they do, all these enzymes that are, that are degrading all the all the li lipids and, and all the proteins. Oh shit, this thing is scary. Um, <laughs> Um, they cause all, the, all these cells to die, um, which, which causes necrosis, and it, it's, it's basically your, your flesh is rotting. And so frequently, uh, the surgeons will have to just get rid of all of this tissue, um, like you see here. Um, you get a huge amount of swelling and blistering as well, and in some situations, this will basically cut off. Sorry. Shall I take it? I might have to get rid of the snake. So. <laughs> so no one this I'll, I'll this is a breach of um, health and safety yeah. as well. This next is supposed to be a meter away from everyone at every point in time. But... 
We have a tape. Okay. Are you okay with it? Um, so all of this swelling and this blistering puts a lot of pressure on, um, on actually your cardiovascular system. So um, all, of the, all of the vessels that are supposed to be flowing and, and keeping, keeping some fresh nutrients in there, getting rid of all the crap, that stops working. So you get this thing called compartment syndrome. And if you let this happen, um, it seriously increases the chance of limb amputation because it means that limb won't have any oxygen and everything. It will have built up with all this gunky stuff. And to stop this, what we do is this beautiful thing called fasciotomy, where you cut down the fascia so that the, the, like, the areas between the muscles, and this releases the, releases all the pressure. But it also means that this can be a very bloody, um, thick, all the local effect. Though, actually, from like a life and death point of view, you don't really care too much about it. Um, but it also um, introduced a lot of bacteria into the system, and it, it means you're going to need antibiotics frequently after the same point. Next, okay. So the local effects are also associated with this beautiful um, muscle damage. And this is from a, a paper we published pretty recently, and it's in a pretty good journal, so we're pretty proud of it. And uh, yeah, um, but basically what you can see here is this is just a cross section of, of a muscle in, in, in mice called the tibialis anterior, which we've injected just with one protein, just a single protein found in snake venom. And all these green, horrible ball things are showing where these muscle fibers have just died, they're, they're, they're dead and rotting. Um, and, and we were looking into the underlying mechanism behind all of this, because what you'll frequently get with people who survive snake bite is they'll have muscle damage that will last their whole life. So you see them with these horrible limbs that are all um, you know, shriveled and mank, and, and you don't really want to shake their hand, but you can feel like it's the right thing to do. <laughs> but anyway, we, so basically there are three, three underlying things. So the, all of these muscle fibers are surrounded by this um, incredible skeleton called the basement membrane, which is loads of different proteins. And it gives them this long structure. But this protein, th these proteins in snake venom actually eat away all of this. And in the worst case scenario, the fibers go, go from being really long, and they just hypercontract. They, they no longer have this, this structure, and they hypercontract, and that same fiber is gone and done. On top of this, this particular protein is like, Imagine razor blades in your vessels. Like, um, so it basically cuts away the inside of your vessels and causes you to hemorrhage. So this is where all the blood is escaping. Um, which means that all of the nutrients, like the oxygen and stuff, that you need to regenerate, as well as certain white blood cells that you need to get in there to get rid of all of this horrible debris that's being created by this protease, um, are no longer able to get in there. And then the really interesting thing, and like the, the fun thing that we found in the study is that these absolutely magical little cells, they are, they are unicorns of muscles, I swear. And they're like these little slugs that live on top of the muscle fiber. And they basically go on the muscle fiber, crawl along it, and then when they find an area of the muscle fiber that's damaged, they just lie down there, they start dividing, and then they turn into fresh muscle fiber, basically. But this protein stops that from happening. It's, it means basically the, the, the satellite cells, these the unicorn cells are just unable to move at the right speed. It means they're unable to, to differentiate, so change into the, the fresh fiber. And this is like one of the major causes of long-term skeletal muscle damage, which is found very commonly in people who've been bitten by vipers. So when the venom actually makes it into the blood, this, this happens. And like, yeah, this, I'm not even gonna start. <laughs> Um, so basically, four, slightly more than four things happen, but put simply, four things happen. So we have this cleaving of the blood vessels, which I just spoke about, which is like when the razor blade is going through the blood vessels, cutting away, you're getting all this hemorrhaging, all the blood is leaving circulation and just going into this interstitial fluid. Um, and on top of that, um, there are certain proteins that are dilating blood vessels. So instead of constricting the blood vessel, the blood vessel is getting bigger. Um, and what this actually means is that there's less blood in circulation. It means that, that um, basically means you, you get hypotension, hypotension. So there's not enough blood really for the heart to pump, so the heart sort of slows and then um, frequently that will happen to such a degree that actually the heart just gives up. Heart failure is something that you relatively frequently will get from viper envenomation if you die. They also inhibit or activate platelets. Platelets are the, the little cells that John's going to be speaking about, and I really want to avoid them as much as I possibly can. <laughs> but um, they inhibit and activate, activate platelets. You'll probably understand what that means in an hour. And um, 
and also act on fibrinogen. So fibrinogen is a protein that's in the blood that works with platelets, and together they form these plugs. So when you're bleeding, they come together, they form a collaboration, and um, basically stop your bleeding. Um, but in envenomation, everything goes haywire, and this no longer can happen properly. So the fibrinogen is sort of broken down when it's not supposed to be broken down, and the platelets are activated or inactivated when it's not supposed to happen. And this causes frequently like unstable clots. So you get these random little clots that are going around in circulation, and this is perfect for just blocking off small vessels and that sort of thing. And it also means you can have so many platelets and so much fibrinogen get broken down and the platelets get out of action that your, your blood is no longer able to clot at all. And this is called coagulopathies. And it's sort of similar to, to people like hemophiliacs, you know, where they, whenever they cut, they just keep bleeding and they can't clot. Um, and so the final, the final major thing that they do to the blood is um, hemolysis. So as we all probably know, like we're full of these, this red stuff called blood, and it's red because we have these red blood cells that are full of hemoglobin. And this, this travels around the body, and all your cells that need oxygen are, are delivered oxygen by this. I hope you're not standing up because I'm supposed to finish soon. Okay, I'm gonna take 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so they, they basically break these red blood cells open and all the, all the hemoglobin um, goes into circulation, which, which isn't normally a big deal. This happens naturally um, and, and it's sort of cleared up. But um, under envenomation, we also published this paper recently. It's crap paper, don't read it. <laughs> but it is, it is mildly interesting and in it shows that a huge number of snake venoms actually oxidize hemoglobin. Um, and that produces this thing called met hemoglobin. And the presence of met hemoglobin in the blood actually increases the affinity, so the binding of hemoglobin to oxygen. Which doesn't sound like it would be a big deal, but if you've got this hemoglobin that's supposed to go around delivering oxygen to the cells, and it's bound to the oxygen so hard that it can't let it go, actually what you get is essentially anemia, um, and it's called methemoglobinemia, and, and this is one of the things that actually exacerbates like um, snake bite, because they're already suffering all these other things, and then also, oh yeah, by the way, your cells have no oxygen. Um, so yeah, super interesting, great paper, give it a read. <laughs> um, so the, the, yeah, the upshot of why from venomation is that your kidneys have to clear up all this crap that's been produced by all these, these proteases and, and lipases, and this can lead to acute kidney injury, um, which is not good, um, and heart failure, and, and the, the collapse of all these vital organs is, is what you're really um, talking about with why from venomation. So now, now we go to what happens in a lap, it's, and it's, it has to be described as a shitstorm. It really isn't good. So this is like quite, probably quite a confusing diagram for most people. But anyway, this shows <laughs> this shows a neuromuscular junction. Um, okay, so this is where a nerve meets a muscle. And if you want any of the muscles in your body to do anything, this has to work. So here, all, all these crosses that you see, these are actually showing places where different venom proteins um, affect this neuromuscular junction. Um, and they're basically binding to iron channels, binding to acetylcholinesterase, which is an enzyme that's essential to su successful nerve transmission, and bind to receptors. And that probably meant nothing to almost everyone in here. <laughs> so instead, what I'm going to do is show you what this looks like in reality, um, which is not good. Um, so this is this is like a young Thai guy um, who uh, who got bitten by this um, snake, which is called Bungus candidus, and it's like a super neurotoxic snake. Um, so. This is like typical neurotoxic envenomation. Like after five hours, you get um, paralysis of all these muscles surrounding the eyes, and you get drooping eyelids, and uh, we call this ptosis. And um, this will swiftly descend into flaccid paralysis, where you lose control of all the muscles in your body. Um, and that includes the lungs, which are pretty important for breathing. Um, so in order to counteract that, you basically have to get put on um, artificial ventilation. <coughs> um, on, yeah, basically you're put on a ventilator. But luckily, this is a really happy ending, and five days later, the guy, look, he looks really happy, he looks like he's had an experience, um, <laughs> but he's fine. And, and importantly, like his, his blood and stuff, his kidneys, they're probably not in great shape, but they're not that bad either. Um, so I probably, hopefully, made you quite um, respectful of venom snakes, but now I just, I just want to quickly go over some of the reasons you should really think, snakes, awesome, snake venom, epic. And, and these are some of the FDA-approved drugs that have come from venom. So, and so I think there's more than 10, um, and they're all pretty cool. I'm just going to go through some of the ones that I think are really cool. Um, so people who have to have stents inserted, so if you've got a clap, collapsed artery or something, um, a stent is like a little tube you put in the artery to stop it being collapsed. 
Um, but if you just stick a tube in an artery, then what the blood does is it clots. Um, and that ruins the whole point of the stent in the first place. So they took medicinal leeches, which are pretty like, uh, yeah, 1800s, I guess, but actually have some pretty cool proteins in them, which are able to stop all this happening. So if you're having a stent fitted, there's a high probability that you're, you're going to have some of these. Okay, this is my personal favorite. This is a, a drug that, that's a painkiller that comes from conus magus. So this is a uh, cone snail. Um, they're like a venomous mollusk that fire these little lances, which are laced with pretty impressive venom. And um, this is a, a painkiller that's a thousand times more powerful than morphine. Um, it's something that's used for people in the late stages of AIDS and cancer that are literally in excruciating pain and nothing else really cuts it. We also have a type 2 diabetes medication that comes from Gila Monster. Gila Monsters are one of the few venomous lizards in the world. Um, and there's a, there's a drug to treat type 2 diabetes. So this is a drug that basically increases insulin levels, it, it decreases the amount of liver fat you have, and, and all these things that, um, that actually make type 2 diabetes livable. And then loads of things to do with platelets, which I don't want to talk about. And then, um, <laughs> and, um, and then some of the some, um, proteins that actually come from from the vipers, um, which are used to treat blood and plasma before surgery. So if you're going for surgery, they may take some of your blood, treat it with these things, and then they use it as a sort of surgery glue afterwards um, to stop any excess bleeding afterwards, which I think is pretty cool. I forgot what's next. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to um, finish up on saying, like, maybe you're thinking that, that snakes are really like horrific and stuff, but it's not their fault that they've got this epic venom. Um, they don't choose to, to kill these people, um, but humans are way, way worse. Um, this is in Texas, this is Sweetwater Rattlesnake Roundup, happens every year. They catch about 100,000 rattlesnakes and then they, it's like a family event, you get to like skin them and um, do finger painting and stuff with them. And um, so just before you, just before you think <coughs> that the snakes are too awful, just actually, <laughs> we're way, way worse. Um, okay, so. Um, take home messages, evolution, epic of course, venom's here because of evolution. Snake bite really sucks and it's probably not one for the bucket list, which will be music to my mum's ears yeah. until recently it was on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> venoms hold huge potential as drugs um, and snakes might be scary but humans are worse. And finally, like a prayer, Susan Boyle's cover, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> have you in tears? <laughs> Um, so finally some thank yous um, to, this is my little supervisor, Shakti, who was actually, <laughs> who, who was actually John's PhD student, so it's a beautiful circle of, of, of life here, and um, he's taught me all, uh, like, at least 30% of what I know, so I love that. <laughs> and then also Harry, who's at the back, oh my god, I forgot to do the experiment, um, okay, I'll do it later. Can I do it now? I'll do it during the break. If anyone wants to see it, it's fine. Okay, um, so thanks everyone for listening. Um, thanks to these other guys who I haven't really mentioned, but <laughs> you were there for me. Um, and now I guess any questions? species to fight the other species, but um, snakes have evolved to, to, to be able to deal with this because if you imagine like a venomous snake, um, it has these, these fangs and it also has a lower jaw. And so frequently if it's biting, it actually doesn't bite into anything, it just bites its own lower jaw. So it injects venom into itself, but obviously that wouldn't kill it because that would be a massive flaw in evolution. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, so depending on how distantly removed, like there are a lot of snakes like king cobras for example, a lot of other cobras that eat other venomous snakes. They eat any snake and, and venomous snakes in that exception and, and um, their venom is, has evolved to kill venomous snakes so they can't do very well with it. But if, if it's like two very closely related species of cobra, they're fine with each other's venom. Yeah. What about a cobra bit of viper? A cobra bit of viper, yeah. The, uh, so I, I, my, my Facebook is pretty lame, it's got quite a few of these like, epic battles between different snakes. Uh, normally, normally the Alapid the survivor, sadly, but um, you do get it the other, in fact, there was one example of, so lots of people breed corn snakes, um, 
I'm sort of embarrassed to have brought corn snakes today because a lot of people who keep king cobras and really cool snakes actually breed corn snakes as well to feed to their cool snakes. Oh. Um, but there was oh. there was one great um, one great image of a corn snake actually eating a king cobra, <laughs> <laughs> which um, yeah was like yeah it's the, the glory moment for, uh, for yeah. corn snakes. Yeah. Right, any more questions? Yeah. Universal anti-venom. Yeah, so this is something like, in the last couple of weeks, it's been the news a lot, like the Wellcome Trust and, and various other people are putting loads of money towards snake bite because there is no universal anti-venom. There's, like there's like a region-specific anti-venom. So like in India, for example, there are four snakes that do most of the biting. So anti-venom is against those four. But in India, they've also got 60 species of venomous snakes. So if you're bitten by the other 56, then you're in quite a lot of trouble. Um, <laughs> But yeah, the, the big the big drive is like by 2021, everyone wants them to be a universal antidote. There's loads of research going into like um, repurposing drugs. So drugs that have been used for other things, but now bring them in to use them against snake bite. And it actually looks really promising. And with 100 million pounds, I think we stand a decent <laughs> chance of getting a better um, anti-venom. So yeah. I think when there was, when there was a potion, what we had in there Yeah, so that is that is like so in that case that was a picture of an Indian woman and that was the Indian anti snake venom as they call it. So then in um, in like the states they have a similar thing that's against the six species of snakes that are likely to bite you and, and cause fatalities in the states. So there is no universal antidote, but all anti venom is made in the same way. That's injecting venoms into horses, taking immunoglobulins, antibodies from their blood. And it, uh, yeah, it's it's all done in the same way, and it's a crap way to do it. It's um, yeah, it was first done over 100 years ago, and it hasn't changed since. Am I happy? Yeah, one more question here. With more and more venomous snakes being kept in this country, um, and with having to use more money, say for example, we had a similar situation to the Everglades where they got out of breath, would we be actually prepared for that? Or I mean, like them? no, there's virtually no anti venom. Um, yeah, getting antivenom in this country is really hard. In fact, getting antivenom anywhere in the world, especially when you're talking about like exotic pet trades, because it's all the snakes are there. You've got limitless possibilities. So you might have antivenom, like in our lab, we've got antivenom against the, uh, the Indian snakes, but uh, you know, there's uh, 700 and whatever other species of snakes. So yeah, no, we're definitely not prepared, but I also think a case like the Everglades, you know, like it's much warmer there. Snakes don't thrive in this in this country. If anything, all of our native snakes are endangered or critically endangered. Like adders are, I don't know how many of you have ever seen an adder. It's a very rare thing. Okay, shut up. <laughs> you don't see them very often and they're normally scuffling away, but I, I, yeah, I, I don't think getting naturalized in this country, yeah, like, yeah, it's unlikely. We would be in an awful position if, if they had <laughs> Thanks a lot.